الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته ومغفرته um, الحمد لله This is Charity Week Everyone who is in university and is part of the Islamic society The ice socks in other words They all know this is the week that all the Muslims are going to be getting together Fundraising for the Muslims that are suffering in parts of the world Now brothers and sisters um, I wanted to make this video as an advice to share some really important things with those of you who are engaging in the fundraising and the fund giving. Those of you who are donating, and those of you who are participating in the activities and arranging it all. Because brothers and sisters, if we don't know some basics uh, with regards to uh, helping the Ummah and whatnot, uh, specifically in the area of charity, then we can r actually raise all the money in the world and it won't actually help the people because the money in of itself is not what's going to make the situation of the Muslims better. Rather, there are prerequisites. The money is like the cherry on the top, but it's not the actual cake, right, itself. That cake, what is it? I'm going to share four principles with you guys that will inshallah ta'ala benefit you in being able to ensure that with Allah's permission when that money is raised and it is sent, it actually benefits the people, number one. Number two, if these principles aren't known to us, then what happens is that we can actually be a means for the catastrophe and the calamities that the Muslims who we're raising the money for, for their situation to get worse and I'll give you evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah if we don't come with these principles in our attempt to make the situation better we actually make it worse and I will share with you exactly inshallah ta'ala what it is that I mean um, I know many of you listening may have you know huge disagreements with regards to me you may not like my position and my stances on many things um, but I really do request for you to please give me an attentive ear because this issue is bigger than us uh, it's bigger than myself or yourself or, or any personal views that we hold against one another it's pertaining to the ummah it's an issue pertaining to the ummah that's suffering at large I mean this is not a personal thing this is lillahs for Allah's sake right charity at the end of the day to benefit those who are suffering so please do share it with me inshallah please do, do, do hear what I have to share with you and at the same time make your conclusions based on the evidences not on the basis of who's saying it. Now, first and foremost, the first principle that I want us to understand, brothers and sisters, is why are the Muslims for who we're going to be fundraising in the situation that they're in? Why are the Muslims suffering? Not just there, even here in this country, everywhere around the world. We are in agreement upon one thing, right? That the Muslims are in a bad situation. We've been humiliated. We're the lowest that we've ever been, right? This is a bad place that we're at. Why? How rather? Who rather? Who put us in this situation? Was it governments? Did governments put us in it? Have we been oppressed by the people? Yeah, we have, but are they the root reason and cause as to why the Muslims are suffering and the Muslims are humiliated? No. Rather, when we go to Surah Ali Imran, we find an ayah that's quite shocking. If you pay attention, Allah said that الملك, من تشاء وَتَنْزِئُ الْمُلْكَ مِنْ مَنْ تَشَاء وَتُعِزُّ مَنْ تَشَاء وَتُذِلُّ مَنْ تَشَاء Allah said it is Allah, the one who owns the dominion. Allah gives the kingdom to whom He wills, He snatches the kingdom from whom He wills. He honours whom He wills and gives strength to whom He wills. وَتُذِلُّ مَنْ تَشَاء He humiliates whomever it is that He, that he wills. Then Allah ends the ayah by saying, وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ He has power over each and every single little thing. So brothers and sisters, say that the Muslims, obviously we know in our tradition, in our history, that we were honoured, we were strong. We, you know, alhamdulillah, we were far from humiliation. No matter if all the enemies of Islam came together to destroy Islam, to destroy our situation, wallahi, not one of them could have done it if Allah didn't allow for it to happen. Remember, man it's, it's him, his will that allows us to be humiliated and honored. We can raise all the money that we want. 
we can do all the petitions that we want, all the protests. Brothers and sisters, pay attention. If Allah does not will, He won't honor us. And because Allah willed, we'll humiliate it. So that's the first point you need to understand is that this isn't between us and Allah. We have to beseech Allah to uplift this from us. The money itself, don't place your trust in it. It's Allah that's going to do it, okay? That's the first principle. The second principle that I want you to understand is why Allah placed us in this situation. Why we're here? Why would Allah humiliate us? There's got to be a reason, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did it. Allah tells us again in Surah al rum Allah tells us that ظهر الفساد the, the corruption has become apparent في, ال, في البر والبحر upon the land and the sea it's spread you can see it now the Muslims are suffering everywhere poverty there's earthquakes there's oppression from external forces it's all ah the Muslims are in a bad place everywhere the Muslim blood is cheaper than oil like women have no honor they take them as captives, rape them, throw them away. Like, the kids are dying. No food to eat, no drink, no water. Fasad! Allah said, it spread in the land and the sea. Why? Where did it come from? Allah said, Bima kasabat aidin nas. Allah said, the reason for it is because of the corruption that the hands of the people, the evil deeds, the sins that the hands of the people have brought forth. Allah said, that is why you see fasad on the earth and in the sea. And Allah said, why? Why? Has Allah shown you that facade? So you can taste the consequences of your action. Because you might be sinning all day. You might be doing sins. And you may not realize that the sins are going to have an effect. On the day of judgment, on the day of judgment, it will hit you suddenly. If there was no warning, no alarm, no nothing, on the day of judgment, it would just hit you like a ton of bricks. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to see before you go to the day of judgment, your sins. Hey, listen. There's consequences. Can you see? You see, you may have become heedless of that sin. Those girls that you're talking to, that music that you're doing, X, Y, Z, these things that you're falling into, you may become heedless and not realize. So before you have to face it on the day of judgment, let me show you that your sins here are resulting in corruption. So you can see, oh my days, yo, yo, hold up, the Muslims need to take a step back. There's a problem here. Allah says, why? So that you may come back, make tawbah and realize that it was your sins you need to repent from them. Brothers and sisters, this is a clear cut ayah, clear cut that tells us that corruption, that the problems that the Muslims, you're inshallah going to be donating, raising money for the brothers and sisters who are suffering. Huge, huge, huge action of worship, sadaqa. But you have to understand why they're suffering. And even us, Everyone's suffering in their own way. Don't think the Muslims in England are not suffering. We're also humiliated, but in a different way. I'm just using them as an example. Why? Because the Ummah as a whole, as a whole, has fell into major corruption, major sins. So, now that we've acknowledged that, we have to go to the third principle, which obviously is, okay, Allah, we know, first principle, you're the one who's doing this to us. Okay? Number two, we know we deserved it. We fell into major sins. Thirdly, okay, Allah, what do we need to do to uplift it? Okay, well, it's you, Allah. You, you're the one who's going to uplift it from us. We know we have to come direct to you. No more politicians, no more petitions. Can't put all our trust in the money, in the sadaqah. No, 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 you, you. Okay, we have to do something between us and you. Regards to our sins. The third principle, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us, stop the sins. Stop the sins. Allah will uplift it all from you. Allah will uplift all of the calamities that the Muslims are suffering from. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah An-Nur, وَعَدُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَيَسْتَخْلَفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كَمَا اسْتَخْلَفَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ Allah said, Allah makes a promise. A promise? Allah is actually having to say, I'm making a promise to you. That's Allah is, Allah, it's, like, it's like, if Allah says something, it's done. But Allah is using this, like, a promise. A promise. I'm not going to say it's done, even though it's Allah and He will do what He says. But Allah showed it's a promise. To who though? The people who come with Iman and Amir Salihat. Righteous actions, they believe properly what we believe in Islam. According to the Sunnah of the Prophet, they have that and then they do righteous actions. And they don't fall into sins. They don't fall into major sins. Allah says, For these people, I will give them strength. I will give them authority on the land. 
قبلهم, just the same way I gave it to those who came before you. Look back to the Sahaba, a people who when the Romans marched past them, they looked at them and they said, these people are not even worth conquering. Not the Sahaba, but the Arabs rather. The Romans said it to the Arabs because the Sahaba weren't around at the time. But the, 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 the Arabs at the time were so backward, they looked at the mountain and they thought the mountain is here to hold up the sky. That was their thinking, brothers and sisters. But these people, when they came with Iman and righteous actions, Allah gave them from the footsteps of China in the east to the shores of Spain in the west. Allah gave them authority on the earth. Then Allah says, and we made them strong, grounded in their religion. No one could mess with them. And then Allah said, we replaced for them the fear that they had with safety. But Allah says, you need to do one thing. Worship me, Allah says. And don't associate partners in worship with me. And that's it. Allah will give it to you. Brothers and sisters, the third principle is very important. The sins that we do have a direct consequence, have a direct bearing on the suffering that the Muslims face in the other parts of the world. For the second principle, I forgot to mention another hadith, but it can come in here as well. The Prophet ﷺ told us that Musa السلام, Banu Israel, his nation came to him and they said, Ya Musa, please speak to Allah. The rain hasn't come down for 40 days. Allah didn't send a single drop of water. Musa said, Ya Allah, please send the rain. The people are going to die of first. Allah said, Ya Musa, there is a man. There is a man from amongst the people and he sins and disobeys me. Tell him to leave. When he leaves, I will send down the rain. Allah withheld the rain from an entire nation, brothers and sisters, because of the sinning of one man. When Musa addressed the people, he said, there is a person from among you who's been sinning, you know who you are, leave and Allah will send down the rain. Nobody got up, but that man in the gathering in his heart, he made Tawbah to Allah. He realized how wrong he was. The moment he came back, Allah sent down the rain. But Musa's confused, alayhi salam, because he's thinking to himself, Allah said, until the person leaves, I'm not going to send the rain. He doesn't know the guy made Tawbah. He just sees that no one left and the rain came. He said, Ya Allah, what happened? And Allah said, Ya Musa, the one who was sinning came back to me and I sent down the rain. And the story goes on. But brothers and sisters, look at this. When you come back from your sins, when you come back from your sins, Allah automatically, He lifts the calamity and the musibah and the problem from the Muslimin. But when you persist on the sins, it could be your one sin that you're doing and you're taking it for granted, brothers and sisters. That one sin that you're doing. And that is the reason why, wallahi, it sounds like it might be big, but I gave you evidences. Maybe one sin that you do as a result of it. A sister that might get raped somewhere. I know that's heavy words. I gave you Quran and Sunnah. I gave you Ayah. Don't, don't, it's not me. Go back to Allah and the Prophet. Sallam. Could be one sin that you do. And it was big to Allah. And because of it, you left it for Allah's sake. And Allah saved a sister from dying out of starvation. Because remember, the Prophet told us that this entire Ummah is like a body. If one part of the body hurts, the whole part of the body feels pain. The same way if one part of the body falls into destruction and sin and Allah decides to punish, that entire body will feel it and feel the consequences and the ripple effects of it. Do you see where I'm coming from, brothers and sisters? Those people who are suffering, they're being expiated. Their sins are being removed. But as a whole, the Ummah is suffering. And the Prophet did say, he said to his wife, it was either Umm Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha or Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha, that he said, if you don't strike the hand of the dim-witted one, stop it, stop it, meaning the one who's about to sin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will destroy all of you. Then she said, will Allah destroy us even though there's good people from amongst us? And the Prophet said, yes, if the evil is more amongst you than the, e than, than the good. But the hadith, Another hadith, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha on a different matter, she asked, said, Ya Rasulullah, the people who didn't deserve, like, the, the, not the people who didn't deserve, but the people who didn't do anything wrong, but they were present when the fitna hit them and they were part of the suffering. They happened to got killed or starved or they were, because there were people that were sinning in the land and poverty struck them and they died, but they didn't disobey Allah. What about them? And the Prophet said, Allah will resurrect them upon their intention. On the day of judgment, they're going to be, Allah's going to do with them based on what they, them directly, they didn't fall into it. Allah's not going to punish them for that. And they might even be rewarded in this life for suffering that they had to go through that they didn't deserve. But they were patient upon it. But you and I need to understand, we want their suffering to be alleviated. It's happening because of the sins, the collective sins of the Ummah. Brothers and sisters, it's a big thing. 
Wallahi Fudayl ibn Iyad rahim Allah, the great alim from the Salaf al-Salihin, the students of the students of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the Sahaba, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to say, I know when I wronged Allah, I know when I wronged Him, I know when I messed up and I did a sin, because I come home and my wife is off with me. My children are disobedient to me, my wife is disobedient to me, my riding beast it is troublesome to me, my horse it creates problems for me, I can't ride it. Why? He said, because I sinned. Not only does it affect them, well, like some of you are experiencing sadness in your life, troubles in your life, difficulty in your life, problems, you want things to happen, your job, this, that, problems, you're trying to get married, it's not happening, it's not working, so, you know, you go home, you ain't done nothing to your parents, but your parents are being rude to you, problems, arguments with your brother, your sister, your car breaks down, sins, well, like, but you need to understand these sins, they go beyond us and they touch the ummah, it, they harm the ummah, brothers and sisters. Now, the fourth principle, and it's really important. Oh, before I go into it, so to summarize the third principle, what, what is it that we need to stop doing? All sins can be divided into three categories, shirk, innovation, and major sins. And of course, there's the minor sins, but just generally, we're sticking with these. The shirk means that you worship someone besides Allah. You go to a grave, you pray to the grave, instead of praying to Allah, to a wali of Allah, to a scholar, an imam, you make dua to him, you ask them to do things that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do. And it's a vast topic, inshallah, you can refer to other videos to get a better understanding of shirk, innovation, to go against what the Prophet said. To go against the sunnah, when you hear the Prophet said this and you follow something else, you celebrate things like the mawlid and whatnot, these things, innovation, bid'ah. The third is just major sins, disobedience in general, zina, free mixing, smoking weed, music, alcohol, disobedience to parents, backbiting, all of these. These are the three sins and they need to be purified and replaced with Tawheed. The opposite of Shirk is Tawheed. The opposite of innovation, Bid'ah is the Sunnah of the Messenger. And the opposite of Ma'asi, these sins is what? Ta, Obedience to Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Brothers and sisters, if you come with this, Wallahi, that money that you give, suddenly you find the people benefiting. The fourth principle that I want to mention is, is it permissible for you to use a haram means to get to a halal end? You know, sometimes you might be doing events and there might be certain things that you have to do that are not permissible. And this is really what I'm trying to come at. There might be speakers that you invite that are, you know, they have a wrong message. You might invite certain performances, people who do music and certain things that are impermissible in Islam. There might be free mixing involved, boys and girls engaging, playing, sitting together, whatnot, that kind of stuff. But you're gonna raise money. You're gonna raise 70,000 pounds, 100,000 pounds, 150,000 pounds. Is that permissible? Can you do that? Brothers and sisters, it's a very broad topic and matter to discuss, but I want to summarize it to you by narrating to you a hadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave us a parable, parable rather, of people who are on a ship. There is a top deck and a bottom deck. Those at the bottom, they can't access the water on their own. They have to go to the top and those are the guys who are bringing the water in and say, guys, can you please bring us some water? Can you bring us some water? So they do that every day. One day those at the bottom, they say, we have burdened those above us. Why don't we drill a hole at the bottom of the ship? The water will come through. The water will come through. We'll be able to see it. We'll be able to see that water. We won't have to bug them anymore. We don't bug them and we get the water. It's a win-win situation. What's going to happen if they do that? If they drill a hole at the bottom, everyone's going to drown. Everyone's going to die. That's why the Prophet said, if the ones at the top don't come down and stop the ones at the bottom, they will all be destroyed. Again, coming back to the issue of the Ummah, one person sins, a few people sins, many of our sins, they come, they collectively affect the whole Ummah. You see these evidences again and again and again. But the point that I want to take from here is when they were going down, there was, was, the, was, was the ends halal, that they wanted the water and they didn't want to disturb the people at the top. The means, was it wrong though? Yes. A wrong means will always bring about disaster that you may not see, but it's there. The wrong means will always bring about disaster. Remember the poet said that in order for a ship to reach its destination faster, it can't cut through land. It can't cut through land. The Prophet ﷺ came at a time when oppression and suffering was worse than it's ever, the, the, the Sahaba they suffered. The Messiah said, I suffered for this religion more than anyone ever who came before me or come after me. They suffered. 
But yet the Prophet was able to allow for that, with Allah's permission, he was able to, with Allah's permission, get that oppression to be uplifted and for the Muslim to be left in authority from the footsteps of China in the east to the shores of the Spain and west. I'm saying if he could do it, then how are we saying we can't? According to the way he did it. He didn't have to go to haram. He didn't have to say, no, no, we're not going to raise the money unless this comes. Because remember, he realized it's not the money. Even if the money comes, it's not going to change nothing. You could have a rave and raise one trillion pounds. Wallahi, it won't change a problem. It won't change a thing in the ummah. Unless Allah wills. Now my question is, do you think Allah will will for our situation to be uplifted if we came with haram? We're knocking at the doors of Allah's rahmah with hands that have blood on them. Or sin or evil. Our hands are covered with filth. Ya Allah, we have charity that we brought through means that were haram and we say Allah please accept this accept this from us accept this from us and Allah is going to look and think where did that money come from put your hands away so these are the four principles brothers and sisters the issue of knowing number one Allah put us here two why because of our sins three uplift your sins and Allah will take us out four you can't use a haram means to get to a halal end and I really the reason I made this whole video was really for one sin that I saw in the eye socks that I really want you guys to work on. There's many different specific things that I don't want to spend too much time exhausting the matter on, but you guys yourself can go into it and reflect and realize, use these principles as a guideline. Can we do this? No. Can we do this? Yes, that's you. But I wanted to advise you on the matter of free mixing. Brothers and sisters, wallahi, it's a problem. Remember, this religion is a religion that shuts off gates to harm. Allah said, Wala taqrabu zina, don't go near to zina. It's the third most big shirk, murder, zina, the top three worst sins that a person can fall into. The Prophet said, Allah said, don't go near it. Cut off all roads and avenues to it. So obviously, brothers, sisters talking, laughing, giggling. I was at an event not too long ago and I saw at the end the way. There was a group of sisters talking to one of the speakers, huddling around him, smiling, taking selfies, pictures. And they were like, they just raised all this money. Wallahi, they have no idea. I was thinking if only they knew, Wallahi, this money is nothing. And they have, today, khair has, the, the, the harm has been more than the khair. And they have now, Wallahi, for the people that they're trying to raise money for, possibly made their situation worse. Worse. Brothers and sisters, this free mixing issue thing is a big thing. Remember the Prophet said that two people don't come together except that shaitan is the third between them. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he told us, he said, fear the dunya and fear the women. For the first fitna that destroyed the Banu Israel was the women. Brothers and sisters, when the Prophet said fear the dunya, who was he talking to? The men or the women? The women. Because the women don't care too much about the men. And the woman only really and truly goes to the man when the man has the dunya. Right? Generally, of course there's exceptions, I'm talking generally, okay? So please don't disagree with me on this, because the Prophet said it, okay? So you disagree with him, so I said him. But generally speaking, a woman is not going to go crazy and go backward over a man. But if the man has the dunya, he's got the cars, the money, the clothes, the Louis Vuitton bags, the Michael Kors bags, he could take out, splash out on her. He's got authority, fame. A woman likes that. The dunya she likes. The Prophet is saying, fear the dunya, my sisters. But then to the men, Allah said, fear the women. Why? Because does the man care about the dunya? Wallahi, a man will spend his whole time living at his mum and dad's house. He won't care. Us men are like that. We're cool, we're easy. But the man chases after the dunya. Why? Because he loves the woman. He knows the woman wants the dunya, so the man will come and chase after the dunya in order to get the woman. So the Prophet said, I'm trying to say, men, basically, you fear the women. And women fear the men because the men have the dunya. The men will get the dunya for the, for the women. And wallahi, when you put men and women together and they can see a man can look at that woman and think, wow, wallahi, I go to events practicing people or allegedly practicing. And they're like, yo, akhi, these sisters. Wallahi, these sisters. <sighs> akhi. And they're all looking, talking, sending little hints. And these things are happening. Wallahi, they're happening. And you're not realizing that that baraka is just being stripped away and the Prophet said this was the first fitna that put the Banu Israel into the biggest problem that they ever entered into <sighs> brothers and sisters wallahi wallahi it's a big thing I want to give you an example of how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was so strict when it came to the issue of free mixing and they will end here when the women will walk on the roads 
and the men would walk. The Prophet separated them. The women would walk on the sides of the roads and the men would walk in the middle. The women would walk on the sides and the men would walk in the middle. That's on the street. Put that to the side in the masjid. In the masjid, a place of worship where no one is coming. No one is coming with intentions that are evil, really, right? And a masjid is a place of worship. We're going to come, we're going to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what we're going to do. We're going to focus on that. Allah, we're going to fear Him. The Prophet is right there. We're praying behind Him. Look how strict the Prophet was. There were the women who were in the back, the men were in the front. There were two entrances. Two entrances. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, Abu Dawood rahimahullah, he narrates this. Umar, uh, Abdullah ibn Umar, he once entered through the women's section. And the Prophet said, Ya ibn Umar, it would have been better if you left that for the women. Very strict, the Prophet The women go one side, the men go the other side. In the Salah, in the Salah, how strict the Prophet was. The Prophet just said, in the Salah, the best row for the men is the front. And the worst row for the man is in the back. And the best row for the woman is in the back. And the worst row for the woman is in the front. Because think about it, the men who are in the front and the women who are in the back, they're the furthest away from each other. But the men in the back and the women who are in the front, they're right behind the men. They're the closest to each other. Even in the salah, when you're crying and you're bowing down to Allah, the Prophet is trying to say, stay far. After the salah would end, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would say, women, you leave first. And the women would enter into their houses. Once they entered inside of their houses, brothers and sisters, then when they were already in, then the men would be told to leave. And Imam Zuhri said, perhaps so that the men couldn't catch up with the women, even in the salah, how it was. What about your events? When the sisters, mashallah, very beautiful, they have the perfume and the makeup, they have the tight clothes, the men, they come there, showing their dunya to the women. They're all looking, they're all attracting each other, talking, sparking conversation. Wallahi, you're telling me, no, you have, you know, you, you can control yourself. Wallahi, you're a liar. I believe you're a liar. Because Allah told us Yusuf alayhi salam, when the wife of the Aziz came to try and tempt him, who was a prophet, Allah said, even him, he would have been inclined towards her and may have fell into the haram if Allah didn't protect him. To show you even prophets, this is the fitna that's so dangerous, brothers and sisters, that even the prophets, if it wasn't for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having protected them in a special, special way, even they may have been subject to it, but Allah protected them and honored them and they're free from that. So brothers and sisters, please, don't allow your efforts to go down the drain. Wallahi, even Ofsted did a study that schools where men and women study separately, they study separately, they perform much better than the mixed schools because in the mixed schools, in the mixed schools, they're distracted. The men are distracted by the women and the women are distracted by the men and they don't perform as well. So brothers and sisters, if they can apply that in, and they come with this telling us, oh, we're extremists, we're segregating. And to be honest, that word segregation is a really bad word as well. They put that word on us. We don't, we're not segregating. It's not segregation, okay? It's just, not free mixing. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? That word is so like war and it makes it sound like I oh, just an apartheid, we put the women there and that's it. It's not like that. Women do their own thing, men do their own thing. They just don't do it together. Everyone's allowed to do whatever it is that they want to do. They just don't do it together. That's all. That's it. Unless they're halal for each other. So, the, you know, the, if, if the students will perform better when it comes to their, them being in different schools, separate gender schools, then would your charity and your fundraising more, have more quality in it. Would you, the same way the students are able to concentrate and do better in their results because they're not distracted by the opposite agenda. If you're not distracted by the opposite agenda, would your sadaqah not be better? Would you not be able to plan and arrange more and fundraise more? You would, wouldn't you? Remember, this is our tradition, you know? And I'll conclude on this. Um, the Prophet Sallallahu he commanded every woman you know, even generally speaking, the women is not come obligatory for them to come even pray Salat or Jummah in the masjid. For them, their best prayer is for them to pray in their home. They can come to the masjid, the Prophet said, if they come, don't ever stop them. And the Prophet commanded Rav, though when it came to Salat or Eid, every woman has to come. The woman wasn't commanded to come pray any Salat in the masjid, except Salat or Eid. Now, Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimullah, the great scholar from the Salaf al-Salihin, he said today, because that was the Sahaba, they were righteous. Because today, the way that the men and the women are, the way that they're kind of loose with each other, I dislike, he never stopped it, he said, I dislike for the women to even come for the Eid prayer, because he knows, they see each other, look at each other, maybe talk. That was back then. That was 
1250 odd years ago. Imagine if Sufyan al-Thawri rahmahullah saw today. Allah, it would be shocking. So brothers and sisters, please remember, we want to benefit the Ummah. We want our sins to be erased so we can be entered into paradise and our brothers and sisters and so the suffering can be uplifted. Wallahi, remember this. Remember this. No help from Allah will come. None! Unless you change the condition of yourself. Allah told us already, Surah Ra'ad, I will not change the state of a people unless they change themselves. Themselves. Remember that, please. Wallahi, please, I beg you, share this video with those who are on the eye socks. Please just make sure every brother and sister engaged in charity week sees this. That's all I ask of you. Wallahi, I did this for Allah's sake, okay? And I just want you to benefit from it. Please, just make sure that they see it. That's all I want for them to see it. Can you guys do that for me? I'd really appreciate that. I just have two announcements and then I'm done. I want to bring your attention to the Muslim Survival Guide. This is generally for everyone. Um, the Muslim Survival Guide is a program where uh, we basically put together the most necessary and obligatory things that we need to know about Islam. There are things that we don't know and we're falling into sins every day and it's actually sinful to not know this stuff. The basic knowledges, the necessary things that allow you to be able to survive in this life on another day of judgment. Because many of the people are not even surviving. And if you speak to those who are already in the program, they can tell you it's opened their eyes. They think they thought that they knew Islam, but they never knew Islam. So if you just go to MuslimSurvivalGuide.com the website, just look at it, just and you'll get all the information there and you'll be able to see, you know, it's something that really everyone needs. So please don't turn away from it. Um, unless of course you've studied this stuff already. The second thing is these videos are a means of your donations and your support and whatnot. So please go to the link below and donate wherever it is that you can if you, if you benefited for, you know, you know, uh, uh, we have to pay wages to the media team and whatnot to be able to do these things. And, you know, alhamdulillah, they're very helpful. They already charge us very, very basic rates. But remember, this allows us to be able to do a lot more khair, inshallah. So muslimsurvivalguide.com, uh, link below for the charity. Uh, please share this around so everyone else can benefit. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Peace.